I invite you to take your uh, seat and to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 is our text. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 964 and you will find uh, our text for today. If, uh, if you're at our Parker campus, we don't have Bibles in the seats right around you, but we do have a table with Bibles on it in the back. You can run back there and grab one right now. No one's going to mind, and we want you to have the Word of God and be able to follow along in our study. Uh, so, uh, by the way, if you don't know, we are one church in three locations, and so we've got a campus in Parker, We're meeting at Parker High School, Alumni Hall, so uh, we're excited about that campus. They're seeing God do great things. Already had nine baptisms through their ministry in six months, and that is an exciting thing, isn't it? Yeah. Shout out to Parker. Way to go. And then uh, we got a McCulloch campus, which is just a mile and a half from here, and they meet 930 and 11 on, on Sundays. And so, uh, you know, they do a worship service like this, only it's, a little, it's unplugged. And we're excited about what God's doing through the McCulloch campus as well. So uh, we hope that uh, wherever you are worshiping God with us at Calvary, that God is going to speak to you uh, today. So uh, we're continuing our Upside Down series, where uh, if you are just recently joined us, or it's your first time here at Calvary, uh, we're looking at the teachings of Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is where it's found. And uh, by the way, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. So we're looking at the teachings of Jesus and we understand that if we apply the teachings of Jesus to our lives, He will turn our lives upside down. He will change our perspective. He will change our relationships. He will change our life. So uh, we're moving into a new section where we're going to be talking uh, about prayer. As uh, Pastor Joe already uh, mentioned earlier in this service, that uh, we would be looking at that. I always, you know, I always forget. If, if you are, uh, video is just the message. So the, the other campuses are having their services. They're not going to see him do the announcements here. So I just blew it. For Parker and, and uh, you know, McCulloch, forgive me for that. Because uh, they're going to be going like, we didn't see Pastor Joe earlier. <laughs> he wasn't on the film. Should make him come up here and do it just for, no, never mind. The, uh, all right, so anyway, if you could talk. To any person at all, for one hour, you've got an opportunity to have a conversation with the person of your choice for one hour only. Anybody who's ever lived, is living, whomever, who would it be? Now, don't tell me. I want you to tell the person sitting next to you. Okay, you've got 10 seconds. Ready, set, go. You guys talk to each other. Who's that person? Who would it be? Who would you like, to, who would you like that conversation to be? Hey, you guys at Parker and at McCulloch, you guys do it too. Don't act like we can't see you. Okay, some of you are having a lot more conversation than just about one name. Some of you are like, well, why would you pick that person? All right, so let's do a little confession now. You could talk to one person, anyone for one hour. Who would it be? So let's see, how many of you said that you'd like to talk to a deceased historical figure like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington or Alexander the Great or Aristotle or even the Apostle Paul. How, who, who said stuff like, like that? Go ahead and raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed. Okay, I see those. Okay, some of you said that. How many of you said you would like to talk to a famous living person like the president or a celebrity or an athlete? Okay, got more hands. Okay. How many of you said you'd like to talk to one of your deceased loved ones? Oh, lots of hands. Okay. How many of you said a biblical figure? Okay. A lot of you did. All right, let's go super spiritual. How many of you said that you would talk to Jesus? Lots of hands. Go. You know what? Those people just raised their hands. I got great news for you. I got great news for you because guess what? You can talk to Jesus. This is amazing. You guys, your prayers are answered. Because you can have that conversation. It's called prayer. Isn't that cool? So the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about prayer. Where Jesus is teaching on it. Uh, he's teaching on spirituality and our public spirituality and how we live that out. And prayer is part of that. So um, we're going to be talking about prayer. And this is kind of important if you're religious at all. Because every major world religion prays. And they all call it prayer, except for like Buddhism, who calls it meditation. But they pretty much do it the same exact way that uh, people do prayer. And so prayer is a big deal to anybody who's religious... Uh, but it's very important if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. So if you're here, 
or at any of our campuses, and you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you really need to learn how to talk to your Savior. This is a big deal for you. And, and Jesus taught on prayer, and if we apply what he taught to our lives, it's going to turn our prayer lives upside down, and it's going to change our lives in significant ways. Now, I've got to tell you, people have had crazy ideas about prayer. I've been in church world for most of my life, and I've heard all kinds of crazy ideas about prayer, but that's nothing new. That's been going on for thousands of years. So let's learn from Jesus. Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 5. And Jesus said, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not... Keep up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Now we're going to pause right there. We're going to stop there. Uh, that's our text for uh, this weekend. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about this because the first thing that Jesus tells us to do is to pray. It's pray, right? I mean, just do it. It's the very first phrase that he says over and over and over again. The first three verses, five, six, and seven. When you pray, when you pray, when you pray. So when Jesus talks about prayer, he's talking about when you pray, not if you pray. In other words, it's not really an optional understanding from Jesus to us about whether or not we're actually going to be engaged in prayer. Jesus assumes we're going to pray. That prayer will be a natural part of our lives. So think about this. If you have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, how do you talk to him? Yeah, it's not a trick question. It, it's the name of the sermon, you know, prayer. That, that's it. That, that's how you talk to Jesus. That's how you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because every relationship needs communication to thrive. Every relationship must have communication if it's going to be healthy. So we need to talk with God if our relationship with God is going to thrive. Now, if you're someone here who says, hey, Jesus is my Savior, and I've had this life-changing experience with Jesus, then I'm assuming that you want that relationship to be healthy and thriving. So when do you talk with God? When do you actually pray? And, and again, that's not a rhetorical question. I don't want you to answer it out loud, but I want you to think about this. Because it's really important, if, if we know that prayer is important, then you need to go, when am I praying? Because Jesus assumed you're going to pray. When you pray, when you pray, when you pray. So when do you pray? Now the Apostle Paul in uh, 1 Thessalonians actually challenged the church, Christians, to pray continually. Pray continually. In other words, he was saying, hey, be aware that God is with you all the time. Be aware that God is there and you can have a conversation with God all the time. But, but when do you give God your focused time and attention? Because I've talked to a lot of people and they go, oh, you know, I always pray. I'm always thinking about God. All right, so let me just put this a different way. Uh, I've been married to Merelda for 35 years. And, and uh, we talk and text throughout the day. I mean, it's just normal. You know, it's, it's back and forth. And when she's doing to us, what I'm doing, if we can, we'll meet up for lunch or say hi for a few minutes. So it's just a back and forth throughout the day. But then that's great communication. I'm always aware that I am married. And I love that. It's not like I go, am I married? Oh, yeah, I am. Uh, so <laughs> it's just, you know, I'm aware of that fact. We're in a relationship and we're, we're communicating. But we need that time that is face-to-face, -face, focused conversation to have a healthy relationship that means that we got to put the ipads and the cell phones down we got to turn off the tv you got to stop putzing around the kitchen and you actually need to you know look at each other and talk to each other for more than like 30 seconds otherwise your relationship is going to shrivel up even though you're having communication all the time you're not spending time 
together. So when do you pray? Because Jesus said, when you pray. And then why do you pray? Why do you pray? Uh, <clears throat> verse 8 uh, has spawned a lot of questions from people to me. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And maybe some of you are even thinking about this. Well, why would I pray? What's the point if God already knows what I need? Why do I need to pray? If God knows this, He, he understands that. You tell me He loves me. He wants to bless me, so I don't really need to pray. Well, see, the problem with that is that reduces prayer to a request for God to do something for you. That, that kind of means that you see God as your servant or your butler to go fix things for you. Or God is your handyman to go take care of problems. Or God is, you know, is Santa Claus because here's your wish list. Or you think God is your genie, so you're going to rub the lamp and see what he does. And none of those are accurate descriptions. God, just understand, God's purpose is not to do stuff for you. Even good stuff. That's not his purpose, to do stuff for you. So, you know, when we come in prayer to God, it's not about just getting him to do stuff we want him to do. See, we need an understanding that prayer is about relationship, not request. Okay, if you're going to write something on that paper besides the blanks that I'm giving you, write that down. Prayer is about relationship, not request. That's why we pray. It's not about getting stuff from God. It's about spending time with God. Because it isn't asking a stranger to do stuff for you. It is inviting your Heavenly Father to be part of your life. See, prayer is expressing gratitude. It's sharing your hurts and your hopes with God. It's, it's sharing your failures and your victories. It's asking for help to obey and direction in life and, and, and for power to serve and to love like Jesus. And yes, for God to bless you and, and help you and help others. Uh, and, and I'm telling you, it's about relationship, not request. But if you have a healthy relationship with God, it's never wrong to ask him for anything. It's never wrong to ask. But see, that's not the primary purpose of prayer, to ask. It's for the relationship, not the request. So Jesus encourages us to pray. And Jesus tells us pretty directly to pray privately. Pray privately. Did you catch that? He said, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Uh, pray privately. Why would we do this? Because prayer is intimate conversation with God. And if we want to grow in our relationship, then we need to grow in that relationship intimately with God. Which means you need to be honest, you need to be transparent, you need to get spiritually naked with God. Okay? That, I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about transparency and openness. And God knows you, but you're getting to know Him requires you to be honest with Him. It requires you to be vulnerable with Him. And that's difficult to do in a public setting. And, and Jesus acknowledges that, that hey... Uh, the hypocrites, the religious people who want others to know how spiritual they are, they go out in public and they stand there in the temple and they stand there in the synagogues and on street corners and they pray because they want people to know how spiritual they are. But So they pray publicly. And they think that by their eloquence and their length that people are going to see, oh, look at how spiritual they are. But intimate conversations should happen in private. That's what Jesus is saying. Intimate conversations should happen in private. And, and, and just like the Pharisees, just like these religious hypocrites would pray publicly so people could see how spiritual they are, that can still happen in churches or life groups. It can happen in our lives too, right? I mean, have you ever been with someone who just kept praying and praying and praying and praying, and you start praying that they'll stop praying? <laughs> Not out loud, you're just really intensely spiritual in that moment, silently, God, please shut their mouths. <laughs> I mean, I confess, I grew up in church, and, and, and if you grew up in church like me, uh, we used to have a, an offertory. You guys remember the offertory? So they would be singing hymns, and they would get to the, you know, 
him before the sermon or something. And, and, and at the end of that song, the, the deacons would walk forward because we had offering plates up here. And one of them would pray. And, and as, even as a kid, you're like, you knew how they were going to pray. Because the same four or five guys did it every week. And you were always rooting for the one who prayed for 30 seconds, not the one who's praying for seven minutes. Just because we want to get out, right? We want to go eat. Honest about that. I kid you not. I was at a friend's church one time. And the pastor prayed for 17 minutes. And I timed him. <laughs> because I got, I, first I started praying that he'd stop, and then I got annoyed, and, and, and by the end of it I was like, do you read the Bible? I, I mean, I, I, look, I want Calvary to pray. I, I want us to be a praying church but that doesn't mean that we're going to have a bunch of meetings where we try to get together as a group and pray together uh, because that's not the best expression of prayer. It's great to pray together. I want us to pray together, but what I really want is you to pray. Alone with God so that God can transform your life. Because the truth is, we seldom risk being honest with God while other people are listening. I do. I'm just going to be honest about that. Public conversations are general topics where our words are guarded and we're aware of who is listening to us. In public prayers, a lot of times they're more about us than they are about me. Because for us to get spiritually naked, I don't really want witnesses. Right? And that's hard to do, to get vulnerable with people that you don't know or you're not close to or, or you don't trust. So the more privacy, the greater intimacy is possible with God. So you got the crowd, and, and look, we all love Jesus. We're praising God together, but we're different places on this journey. We have different struggles, and, and uh, you know, we're, if we're all confessing seriously, uh, I might get distracted because I'm like, what? What did they just say? I, no, that's, that's not healthy. And, and, and so we're going to pray as a crowd. We've already done that several times in this gathering. But, but then I hope you pray in your life group. And you're going to, if you, I hope you're in a life group. And, and I hope you pray as a life group because your life group is your friends that you're sharing life with and, you're, and you love Jesus together. And hopefully you're sharing <clears throat> your hurts and your heart and you're able to pray for each other and, and you're a lot more comfortable being vulnerable in that group. But you're still not going to get Gut level on us. And, and then you've got your family. And I, and I hope and pray that you're praying with your kids or grandkids. That's the only time I'm really excited about praying publicly. Because that's, that's an encouragement and education that you have with your children. I hope you're praying with your spouse. I want your spouse to hear you asking God to bless them. Asking God to help you bless them. Thanking God for them. That's a beautiful thing. But then I hope that you're spending time alone with God where you really can be honest and transparent and it can be confession and it can be praise and it can be celebration. It can be all of those things that need to be. Because when we're alone, we can, be, we can just experience that raw transparency. We can talk with God about our greatest hopes and we can confess our worst impulses. But if the only time you talk with God is in public... You're missing out on intimacy and honesty with God. Jesus wants us to pray. He wants us to pray privately, and he wants us to pray purposefully. Did you catch that in verse 7? And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Pray on purpose. See, prayer is relationship and it's communication in that relationship. And last time I checked, volume doesn't usually help the relationship if that's all there is. Right? By the way, loud isn't the best way to communicate with God. It's not a bad way. I mean, honestly, I don't think it matters if you're loud or quiet. It doesn't matter if you're silent, if it's written, you know, or if you're just thinking the thoughts but you're not saying about it. It doesn't matter how... Uh, volume doesn't matter. Repetition doesn't really help. Uh, it doesn't bless. In fact, uh, some people would call it nagging or just uh, irritating. And why would we think that noise or repetition or volume would help? Well, I mean, sometimes we learn flawed models or hear weird things. 
I mean, again, many religions practice repetitive praying. Islam does. Hindus uh, practice repetitive praying. Buddhists do. They call it meditation. And even Christians do this. So how many of you uh, grew up uh, learning the rosary and praying the rosary? Okay. A lot of hands go up. You pray the rosary. You, remember, you memorize that, and, and it's a prayer that you say over and over again. How many of you have ever repeated the Lord's Prayer? Or what's called the Our, Our Father. You know, and you learned it, and you memorized it, and you went, okay. And, and sometimes you go, oh, that, that helps me. How, how about this? If you grew up in the evangelical church like I did, uh, how many of you said the sinner's prayer more than once? Right? Yeah. See, a lot of us did that because we're like, i got to make sure I'm really, really saved because after last night, I'm not sure. <laughs> right? Isn't that what we kind of do? We're like, oh, man, I really blew it. i got to make sure. I don't know if a Christian could do that. i got to pray it again. God, I really, really, really surrender this time. Uh, and... and and here's the thing, none of those are wrong, they're just immature. It's immature, just it's repetitive prayers. You see, God isn't impressed by our words. So if you're afraid of praying out loud because you're afraid you're going to say it wrong, don't be afraid. God just wants you to talk to him. God wants you to talk with him. He wants to have that communication, he wants to spend that time with you. Um, Think about this. Prayer is communicating in your relationship with God. God is our Father, and we are the children. You're His child. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're a child of God. And children begin life unable to speak. Now, they make sounds, but they don't speak, right? They cry. They coo. Uh, I mean, I've got two grandchildren who are, you know, under a year right now. And they're at the, you know, discovering a voice stage. So they, you know, make weird sounds and with their lips. Right? That's fun. It's a little messy, but it's fun. Uh, one of them kind of likes to squeal. You know, just kind of like, ah -ha! That's it. Just, you know, and, and, and he loves to hear his voice that way. So it's a lot of fun, but I don't understand what they're saying. Although it's still communication because after I tossed my granddaughter up in the air a few times... And set her down, she grabbed my knees and went, Urgh! I went, oh, that's again. <laughs> I understand that. Right? I mean, so it starts without words. But we grow up. And as we grow up, guess what we learn? We learn words. You get a little bit older and you start using words. You don't know a lot of them, so you use the same words a lot. Right, moms? Mom, mom, mama, 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 mom, mom, mom. Until you hate the sound of that glorious word, right? <laughs> or how about no? Once a kid learns no. Go do this. No, 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 no. And they learn to say it with the same attitude that you do. No. <laughs> right? And then the favorite word. Come on, you guys know what it is, right? I got a, I got a three, almost four-year-old. Why? Grandson? Yeah, why? 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 And see, and, and they ask those words. They use those words because they don't know a whole lot of other words. Again, the immaturity. And then they grow up a little bit more. And they start using sentences and they can communicate needs and wants. And then they grow up a little bit more and, and they're able to communicate ideas and fears and dreams. And, and, and we continue to grow up and it gets to a point where we can communicate complex thoughts and problem solving and solutions and responsibilities. If we grow up, you see, your words don't really matter to God all that much, but your heart does. Your heart matters. And, and you bring your heart to God, and he's not worried about the words, but, but he wants to communicate. So do you want that living, dynamic, life-changing relationship with God? Then pray. Pray. It, you, prayer's got to be a part of it. It's not going to happen without prayer. And, and when you pray, because Jesus says, when you pray, trust God with the answers that he gives you. Trust God with the answers. And, and, and you see, when you grow in trust, when you grow in a relationship, that trust is going to grow with the relationship. So the more you learn to communicate with God, the more trust in God you're going to have in your life. And that trust bleeds over because when things get difficult, uh, you trust God, even when you don't understand all the details. Because you've got the relationship and you're talking with him and, and, and you hold on to him tighter when the storms come rather than letting go and being afraid. 
And so we grow in trust and we bring ourselves and our needs and our requests to God and we accept his answers even when we don't like them. Because we trust him, because we're talking to him, because we have communication, because we have a relationship. So we might pray for healing and sometimes God heals miraculously and sometimes he heals eternally. And we don't like that. Because we always want God to heal the way we want him to, right? But he tells us through the Apostle Paul that to live is Christ and to die is better. It's gain. And there's an eternity waiting for everyone who is in Christ where there's no more suffering or, or sorrow or death or pain or politics. That's heaven. See, that's what's next. And, and so we pray for healing and we got to be okay when God doesn't heal the way we want. We ask God for provision. God, I want, I need. Can you give this to us? And yet when he doesn't give us what we want, we're still content with what we have because we trust God to give us enough. We pray for direction in our lives. God, where do you want me to go? And, and then we follow where God leads, even if we think we want to be someplace else. Anybody else ever develop a bloody forehead from pounding it on the door that God won't open? Because I certainly have. Um, just a confession. I came to Calvary as, as lead pastor in 1992 as a little church. My first pastorate, my only pastorate. I like to say nobody else would hire me. Uh, and, uh, and, and there was a lot of time, especially in those early years, uh, where I prayed, God, get me out of here. I, I never intended to stay. And, and uh, you know, it was going to be three, four years. It was first church. I was going to make lots of mistakes. I was going to move on someplace else. Uh, but, uh, and there were times I asked God to move me, and, and uh, he said no. And I wasn't really happy in those moments. But I'm thankful that God said no. I'm thankful that God said stay uh, because he could see what he was building and I couldn't. See, his plans are always better than what we think we want. But that only is developed when we trust God because we have that conversation with God and we talk with God and we remember that prayer is about relationship, not request not request and, and so we want to know Jesus better we do not want to try and manipulate Jesus and if the point of your praying is trying to manipulate Jesus trying to get God to do what you want then you need to change the purpose of your prayer and let it be about relationship more than request but we need to pray when you pray so here's the challenge. We, we, we're a church. Most of the people in here believe in Jesus. Most of the people in here, uh, you know, heard stuff on prayer before. Most of us are like, yeah, I should pray more. I know. So here's the challenge, because we all know that. There's a few in here that, yeah, I don't know anybody who prays too much, so I'll just be honest with you on that way. So here's the challenge. I'm going to challenge everyone to spend one hour this week in purposeful prayer. One hour. One hour where you put the, the, turn the technology off, don't look at it, don't play with it, don't use it, get away from the noise. I know some of these moms of young children are going, I will take that <laughs> in an instant. Uh, just some, uh, take a Bible and some paper and have a long, slow conversation with God. Let it be a time of praise and thanksgiving. Let it be a time of confession and asking for forgiveness let it be a time of of intercession where you're praying for other people asking god to help them let it be a time of seeking his wisdom and asking him to teach you what he wants let it be a time where you open the bible and you let god speak to you see that's the two-way conversation that happens and then you figure out how he wants you to change your life And, and by the way, if you can't imagine how that hour would unfold right now, some of you are going, I, I, I can't even, con you know, you don't have a concept for what, how to spend an hour with God. We've got cheat sheets for you, okay? Out of the connection centers, at all of our campuses, there are uh, these pink half sheet papers that are prayer guides. And if you can't just go and spend an hour with God on your own and have that time be fruitful, take one of those. And it's got scriptures to read. It's got questions to ask yourself. And God, is, you know, it's, it's just a guide to help you spend that hour. You can spend probably two hours with it, but you can get, spend an hour. 
Because if you're serious about God changing your life, if you're serious about your relationship with Jesus Christ growing and becoming this, this just joy in your life, then we've got to pray. So the challenge is for you to pray. One hour this week. Now, I could put you on the spot and go, okay, who's going to do that? Let's raise hands. Let's make you stand up. And it doesn't matter what you tell me. It doesn't matter uh, if you say, yes, I'm going to do it or don't. I'm not going to do it. None of that matters because here's the, here's the real choice. Are you going to choose to have a conversation with your Savior? Some of you said you want to talk to Jesus for an hour. I'm setting up the date. Here's the crazy thing. The God of all creation is eager and waiting to have that conversation with you. Doesn't that make your heart leap? Doesn't that make you excited that God is waiting and wanting to talk with you because Jesus wants a real life-changing relationship with you? That's why he died. That's why he rose from the dead. That's why we celebrate. Because you are the object of his affection. Let's pray. Father, we love you. But we don't love you enough. We don't love you enough to set aside time, to make you a priority, to, to walk with you and talk with you, to listen to you. So God, we want to repent. Not just in word, but in deed. And so uh, draw us to yourself. Let us walk out of this, this place and, and look at our schedules and figure out a time that we're going to give to you this next week. An hour at least of, of just focused time face-to-face -face with our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that you're drawing us into this. We, a lot of us are feeling it right now just that you want to have that. You delight in that closeness, that intimacy. So God, we commit because you are inviting us to come. So let us lay aside all the things that get in the way, all the hindrances, all the obstacles, all the problems, and let us meet you face to face. That's our prayer. Because we know if you do that, you'll change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.